This is the wing for the Dark Arrow 1. It's strong enough to support thousands of pounds of lift load while remaining exceptionally light. Part of the secret to that is it's made out of carbon fiber composite. But there's more to the structure than what you can see here. Let's talk about the design of the structures inside the wing. The design of the wing on the Dark Air One is dictated by our mission requirements. Our mission is high speed, long range flight, and then we have sub requirements that dictate the structure of the wing. Our aircraft is a normal category aircraft, meaning it's going to see plus 3.8, minus 1.5 Gs in standard operating conditions. These are its limit loads. These are the loads that it has to see day in and day out without complaint. The ultimate loads where the structure actually fails are a safe margin beyond the limit loads. We want our wing to be stiff. That's so we avoid any negative air elastic effects like air elastic flutter, structural divergence, or control reversal. The other issue with the controls and wing stiffness is that you can imagine that if our wing was too flexible, it could bend up under a high G-load maneuver and actually jam the controls. So we want the wing to be stiff to keep the controls safe. We also want the wing to be light it's not difficult to make a structure that strong if we have no regard for weight, but we do care about weight with our aircraft because we're fighting gravity. Any weight we remove from the structure turns into more useful load that we can use for carrying fuel, and that helps us meet our long range goal. The shape of the wing is a constraint at this point. If you watched our video on the wing aerodynamics, we showed how we came up with the plan form shape, the wingspan, and the airfoil cross section. If you haven't checked out that video yet, give it a watch. I'll put a link up above. It'll add some context to this discussion. The structure for the wing has to fit in this geometric envelope. We don't want any structure hanging outside of this like bracing wires or struts. That's just gonna create drag and that's gonna negatively impact our high speed requirement. Before we can go into designing a structure based on these requirements, we need to know a little bit more about the loads on the wing. The lift load is the greatest of the aerodynamic loads on the wing, so we're gonna focus on that for this video. There's a couple different ways we can approximate the lift load distribution on the wing. A popular method is called the shrank approximation, and that basically takes an elliptical lift distribution and averages it with your plan form shape of your wing. So our wing has a linearly tapered plan form shape, so we'd assign a linearly tapered lift distribution and average that with an elliptical distribution to get a lift load distribution that looks something like this. The important takeaway here is that the wing is loaded in a cantilever bending mode. That means that the wing is extending out horizontally from the fuselage. It's fixed and constrained at the root of the wing where it meets the fuselage and the lift load is trying to bend the wing up. You can imagine that as the wing bends up, that's going to force the top portion of the wing to get a little bit shorter. It's gonna create compressive stresses in the top of the wing. And then the bottom of the wing is gonna get a little bit longer as it bends up. That's gonna create tensile stresses in the bottom of the wing. Now that we know a little bit more about the structural requirements of the wing and the loads on the wing, we can start to design a structure that's gonna withstand these loads. A structure that's very effective at resisting bending loads is an I-beam. Maybe you're already familiar with an I-beam. It has a cross-section shape that looks like an eye, like this. The top and bottom pieces of the I-beam, these horizontal sections are called the flanges, and then the vertical piece of the I-beam that connects the flanges is called the shear web, or just the web. The reason that an I-beam is effective at resisting bending loads is because of its cross-sectional shape. You remember when I mentioned the wing bending, I said that the top portion of the wing is gonna go into compression, the bottom is gonna go into tension. You can imagine there's a surface somewhere in between the top and bottom of the wing skins where there's a neutral axis, where there's no change in length and there's no tensile or compressive stresses. As we move outward in the thickness direction from that neutral axis, the stresses and deflections are going to increase. So the more material we place further away from that neutral axis, the more effective it's going to be at resisting bending loads. And that's exactly what we have with our I-beam cross section here. We have the maximum amount of material placed far away from the neutral axis. I've drawn the neutral axis as this red dotted line here. And then we removed as much material as possible near the neutral axis where it's not really doing much work in terms of resisting bending loads or deflection. We can take this I-beam and incorporate it into our wing to create a structure that's gonna resist bending. We'll run it along the full wingspan direction and that's called a spar. Oftentimes you'll see a main spar that's near the thickest portion of the wing and then sometimes we'll add in an aft spar closer to the trailing edge of the wing and we can attach control surfaces like flaps or ailerons onto that aft spar. If we're building a spar in a composite wing, oftentimes we'll modify that I-beam cross section to look more like a C. This is a little bit easier to make out of composite materials. When we build a spar in a wing, we'll refer to the top and bottom pieces of the spar as the spar caps instead of the flanges. The 
web here is still called the web or the shear web. In composite aircraft wings with a spar, there's kind of two conventional approaches that you'll see. You can imagine if we took a slice through our wing and looked at the cross section, you'd see something like one of these two options. Both of them have the spar located near the maximum thickness area in the airfoil cross section, and then they build the airfoil shape out from that. The first one of these that I'll talk about is what you'll see in moldless construction. Basically, we'll take a section of foam core and build that airfoil shape off of the spar using a solid foam core. This little wing doesn't have a spar in it, but you get the idea with the solid foam core that supports the airfoil shape. And then we have the skin built around that airfoil shaped foam core. This construction method is really popular in canard style aircraft like the Long Easy, Cozy, and Velocity. There's a modified version of this construction approach where we hollow out the inside of the wing so that we can carry fuel in the wing. There still will be a little bit of core material in the skins, either a foam core or a honeycomb core to make the wing skin into a sandwich panel structure. They'll also often add a couple of ribs into the wing like this in the cordwise direction. I have my little ribs drawn in red here and those support the skin against buckling and help maintain that airfoil shape. The big advantage with this approach though is that it's hollow and now we can carry fuel. This is pretty popular in aircraft like the Lance Airs and glass airs. We didn't use either of these approaches in the Dark Arrow 1. We came up with a different structural solution that we called hollow grid. And hollow grid is characterized by not having any centralized spar. It has more of a distributed spar that's spread out across the airfoil shape. It has more of a cellular structure that looks like this. The spar caps are integrated into the wing skins and then we still have some internal structure in the wing to support the skins against buckling. We have ribs and shear webs in the wing that look like this sort of arranged in a grid pattern, hence the name hollow grid. This is a little test wing we have that shows the cross section through a hollow grid style wing. You can see there isn't a centralized bar, it's more like a bunch of mini I-beams that are combined together into an airfoil shape. Why did we take this approach? Why didn't we just build a standard composite wing like this? We actually did start out with a standard composite wing design. And then as we were working through the design, figuring out the arrangement of the structure and calculating stresses and how heavy it would be, we came up with this hollow grid idea and pursued it in parallel. And we figured out that the hollow grid wing for our aircraft presented a couple advantages over the conventional design. We saw that when we integrated the spar caps into the wing skins, it was able to do somewhat of the job of the foam core that we have in the wing skin here and stabilize the wing skins against buckling. It doesn't do the full job though, and so we have to add in a little bit of interior structure to support the skins. And that's what this hollow grid interior structure is. This is specific to our design, but we figured out that when we compared the conventional wing with our hollow grid wing, it was about 10 pounds lighter. The total weight on our wing is only around 100 pounds, so we're looking at about a 10% weight savings. We also found that it could carry a little bit more fuel because we're opening up the internal of the wing a little bit more. It turned into about five more gallons of fuel capacity for our design, which helps us meet our long range requirement. One of the most interesting advantages with this hollow grid approach was an improvement in manufacturability. I won't go too far into the manufacturing yet, but I will say it basically allows us to eliminate molds. All these internal ribs and shear webs are cut from a generic bulk sandwich panel using a CNC router. Since we're using a router to cut them out, the process is a lot more automated and we don't need to mold each of these parts individually. So just on the wing alone, we were able to eliminate the molds for the spar, the spar caps and the ribs. There's at least a dozen molds there. And then when you spread this approach across the rest of the aircraft, you're able to eliminate even more molds. The other cool advantage with this approach is that it allows us to iterate on the design and optimize the structure without having to update or revise the tooling. Basically, if we want to change the internal structure, we can just change the CAD model, update the tool paths, and then cut out new structures without any update to the tooling. And we already did this on the prototype. We actually came up with a couple different arrangements for the internal structure as we were designing the prototype. Part of what enabled this design approach was the use of composite materials, specifically carbon fiber composite. Carbon has some interesting mechanical properties that are advantageous to achieving the goals that we're trying to meet here. It has a high strength to weight ratio and a high stiffness to weight ratio. That allows us to make structures that are strong, stiff, and light all at the same time. It also has anisotropic mechanical properties, meaning that the properties are directional and the strength and stiffness of the structure is aligned with the orientation of fibers in the structure. And we can use this property to create structures that are optimized and tuned to withstand the loads that are applied to them. For example, in the spar, we can orient fibers in the spanwise direction within the spar caps to better resist the tensile and compressive loads that show up in the spar caps. 
in the shear web of the spar, we can orient our fibers at plus and minus 45 degrees relative to the span direction of the spar, because that's the direction of our highest stresses in the shear web. We can also create laminates that are optimized for the loads that they're subjected to. So in our wing skins, we can add unidirectional fibers oriented in the span wise direction to better resist the tensile and compressive loads that appear in the wing skins when the wing is subjected to bending loads from lift loads. If you want to learn more about this, we actually teach a two day aerospace composites course where we go into more depth on all these properties and how to design structures with these materials. I'll leave a link in the description of this video if you want to check that out. So all these properties are pretty awesome, but composite materials are a little bit complicated to analyze. Not only do we have a complicated shape to analyze, but we also have complicated material properties. So we have to rely heavily on physical testing to validate our structures. A lot of people ask, can't you just simulate your structure? Can't you plug the design into an FEA program and have it spit out the stresses and deflections? You can't really go straight to simulation with composite materials unless you have good mechanical properties that you can feed into the simulation program. And you get that data from physical testing. If you want to build structures on certified aircraft, the validation process you go through is outlined in the FAA document AC20-107B and the validation method is called the building block approach. The idea here is that you break a bunch of generic small coupons and measure their mechanical properties and then feed that data into the FEA to refine your results. You also use those test results to guide the design of larger less generic structures like ribs, shear webs, spars and ultimately full composite structures. That's what we did on our craft in the Dark Arrow 1. We broke a bunch of small test samples and then used that data to guide the design of larger structures and worked our way up through the horizontal stabilizer, vertical stabilizer, and ultimately the wing. Along the way, we conducted physical testing on each one of these structures to confirm that it could withstand the loads that it was gonna see in flight. All this testing culminated in the proof load test for the wing, where we subjected it to simulated aerodynamic loads in both the positive and negative G directions. Okay, that's a high level overview of the structures in the wing of the Dark Arrow 1. Next up we're going to talk about the manufacturing. How do we actually build composite structures like the wing? We're going to save that for the next video and leave it here for now. So thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.